I'll take over. Thanks, Stacy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm Justin Boss with First Homes. Um, just, I guess, a quick little background. Definitely no expert when it comes to condos or townhomes, but I've worked on a few of the projects. Did 12 units a couple of years ago, working on six units right now. Worked on a few acquisition, uh, kind of rehab style uh, acquisition of townhomes. So just, you know, been working in it a little bit. Um, and uh, definitely encourage people to ask questions at any point. You know, this material is kind of dry. I'm pretty dry, so <laughs> any sort of relief you guys can give me um, would be <laughs> grateful across the board. <laughs> um, but sort of jumping in, putting this in perspective, you know, we've got our, our spectrum of, of different housing types. Sort of working on the left, we've got like our most dense kind of multifamily um, and sort of rental thing with apartments and then moving into co-ops, which I don't even want to scratch the surface on, but sort of a hybrid between a condo and an apartment. Um, and then we've got condos and townhomes kind of in the center, and that's obviously going to be the emphasis for, for this uh, presentations. And then as we're moving closer to more of a single family detached, we've got twin homes and, and then single family. So, you know, we're going to be talking right here. Um, so starting off with condos, just kind of going to set the stage for you know, what they are and what townhomes are here. So um, Minnesota state statute, I know there's other states here, so I don't have all the state's laws figured out, uh, not even Minnesota. But um, <laughs> anyways, there is regulation uh, on the books um, that defines these things. And basically, uh, you know, a condo is you're buying your unit and a share of the overall uh, property. So if it's four units, you know, you own your unit in the four walls, but then you own one fourth of the entire uh, building and all the co common areas as well. Uh, so some of the advantages of this type of project, uh, you are able to do higher density, a smaller footprint because you can go vertically and subdivide vertically. Um, there's, uh, very little maintenance required of each owner because you're pooling your resources and um, that's typically handled by property manager or whoever the HOA decides to to um, manage the, the maintenance and, and the upkeep. Um, you have the flexibility to change your interior. You can paint the walls, you can change the cabinets and do all the things like you can in traditional home ownership. Um, just to match your lifestyle and your taste. Um, and then on the affordability side, uh, condos are typically um, your lowest price point. Um, so it gives people an opportunity to kind of take that smaller step into home ownership and also able to hit um, buyers that are at a lower um, area median income. And then you also have the, the security of being in a in a more dense um, project or, or property, typically you've got like a, a common door that is locked that everybody has to go through. Um, some of the disadvantages is the monthly dues are are higher because of that maintenance and that upkeep that's being taken care of by the association, um, and you have to maintain replacement reserves, so when the roof needs to be replaced or windows or driveways or things like that that are common elements, you've got to have money in the bank to cover it. Um, there can be accessibility concerns. So if you've got maybe an older uh, population demographic or um, disability, a lot of times multiple level condo units are walk-ups, so you've got to think about that, and elevators, and accessibility. Um, often you've got limited or detached parking situations um, and really limited access to storage. So if you've got a household with two cars or just more stuff, it's not going to be advantageous. Um, you've got noise issues because you've got neighbors on either side of you, above you, below you. 
Um, pet limitations oftentimes, you know, depending on what the association creates for rules. Sometimes cats are allowed, sometimes small dogs, sometimes no pets. Um, and then really on the development side, you're limited to what the underlying zoning um, ordinance says. So you can't just plop up a condo wherever you want. It's got to align with the, the land use and, and zoning. Um, and then some considerations. Um, if you're thinking of doing a condo. Is there, there is a little more risk. Like if you, as a CLT or the developer, you are taking on a little more risk with uh, a longer warranty period. Um, I know here in Minnesota, there's been some, um, there's a little bit of a kind of cottage industry with attorneys going after um, or kind of teaming up with associations, say a few years into the project and trying to point out um, construction defects and going back after the developer to, um, to submit claims and, and try to get funds out of them. Um, you do need to, uh, so the ground lease would not be applicable, so you need to draft a separate document that would be a deed restrictive uh, covenant. Um, and it's, it's just not as secure as the ground lease if there's a foreclosure or something like that. Why, why is the ground lease not applicable? Yeah, yeah, you don't have the, the ownership of the, of the ground like you do with a townhome or a single family detached. CLT yeah, so that's where the deed restriction mm -hmm. restriction covenant comes in. And there's probably half a dozen other terms for it, but basically it, it reads very much like a ground lease. It outlines, you know, what they can and can't do with the property, what the resale process is, what the resale formula is, um, what happens if there's default, just all those things. Yep. I think that can be done a lot of different ways. There's a lot of different ways, and we'll touch on, as we get into a couple of the projects a little bit later on, you'll see some different ways that condos have been developed within community land trusts. So I, I think there's a number of different variations, and it can be all of those things. Um, so we'll, we'll get into a bit more detail in just a little bit. Yeah, thanks, Stacy. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, condos are better suited for smaller households. Shipped over to townhomes. Um, again, there's statutory language about, you know, the state defines a townhome as a unit, um, but it's very similar to the condo um, language in that you own your unit, and oftentimes you even own, you know, say maybe three feet outside of it, so you do own a little bit of the landscape, things like that, and then you own a share of the overall um, building as well. Um, some of the advantages to a townhome is it's definitely closer to traditional home ownership. Um, and, um, you know, you can even, you know, do some of the landscaping and things like that. Um, you oftentimes have lar larger units. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're three and four bedrooms, so they'll fit larger households. Um, you do get the ground lease um, protection and and everything that comes with that. Um, you um, don't have the noise issues as, as much. You don't have a neighbor above you. Um, maybe, you only, you know, maybe you end up with an end unit and you only have one neighbor. Those are all the, um, often coveted units. Um, and most often times you get an attached garage, sometimes a two car garage. Um, and just have that ability to have more storage. Um, you often have your own deck or patio. Some of the disadvantages then are, um, you know, really dependent on on how the HOA and how the common interest community, the CIC docs, which I'll talk about later, are written. But um, that uh, that monthly HOA fee um, is typically a little lower than a condo, but um, the trade-off is you might have to do a little more, if you're the homeowner, you might have to do a little more of your own maintenance um, and uh, typically a higher price than a condo. And just uh, some considerations would be these, 
better for a mid-size household. Um, and um, the fact that you get that ground lease uh, protection. Any questions on any of that so far? Any other considerations or benefits or things that I probably overlooked? Just curious if at some point if you touch on setting aside uh, replacement reserves in a townhome versus a condo, what other organizations are doing to make sure that townhome owners are doing that? Let's actually, um, I'm not sure if we touch on that, so I'm just going to put it up here as a question read so that we can touch base on that when we get to kind of more general discussion. So, um, yeah, it's a fantastic question. Um, I think this may be the same question, but from my novice perspective, yeah. is do CLTs homeowners pay an HOA fee? Yes, they the do. Town, the town Yes. Yep. Yes, they do. And it depends on how it's been structured. Sometimes it's the same across. So if so, um, our experience has been predominantly in mixed income. So it's a number of I think somebody read you mentioned having one in a five, you know, five unit development. So in our case, we have um, they're paying the same amount as everybody else. We are in discussion with and have been in discussion with the developer on a condo development that is looking at the per square footage versus this the same you know across the board so there are some different philosophies on how land trust units and hoa fees are established aaron i wonder also if you can touch on um, just kind of like insurance either uh, because of construction defects at least in colorado and the real challenges of doing condo development versus townhomes and so i'm wondering if that's a Something you come up with. You have to do wrap insurance, so your wrap insurance for condos is going to be far more expensive on a per unit basis than it is going to be for getting insurance uh, on townhouses. Hmm. And are you talking from the homeowner's perspective or as the developer? Sorry, I'm talking about from the developer construction side, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's, at least down in Rochester, there's been a halt to any sort of condo development just because they're scared of that risk. Yep. yep. Um, I'm hoping that we can do a, a condo project down in Rochester in the next uh, year or two um, and sort of maybe break the, the stalemate with that. But, um, yeah, it's definitely a, an issue. They said it's, the, you know, it's around the developer, but I also would say it's on the CLT homeowner and the CLT itself, right? Because in my experience, we went through a lawsuit many, many years ago where we were mad as the land trust went all out, but uh, HOA was, you know, the association was, uh, contractor, et cetera. And then as, as the owner of the land, we went to kind of bring together, like, hey, let's figure out how to work through this. Um, and again, this is probably five years after the community was completed. Um, but I think the challenge there is then once we tried to broker some conversation, then we got pulled into the lawsuit. And so then another, call it three to four years of going through uh, mediation to get to the settlement that could have been addressed years before at a lower price. So just, sorry. No, I think it's, 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 it's a reality for Yeah. Us. Yeah. Yep. And, and we'll be able to, to touch on that as we go through a couple of the, the projects because we've had, even just having a small amount of units in developments, we've ended up in some pretty interesting situations with construction defects as well and those claims and warranties. No. But, yeah, no. so will you. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. I'll keep going. Um, all right, we're going to shift gears and talk a little bit more about the different development models. Um, so the, the three we decided to highlight that are, feel like are the most common are the CLT is developing the entire project, two, the CLT co-develops, so works with, so kind of like uh, the one gentleman talked about, they'll do one unit out of a five um, unit row house. Um, so they develop a portion of a new project. And then three um, is that the CLT will go in 
much after the, the townhome or condo was built and by individual units. So the first uh, first model is that the CLT is um, the, the primary developer. Um, and so just kind of have a, a generic sequence of how that would look is um, you'd go out and um, seek funding from your state finance agency or local funding partners or whoever your, your funders are. Um, and then depending on what level of funding you're able to, to procure, um, you go out and find a parcel of land. Again, you'd need to be looking at what the underlying zoning district is and things like that, depending on how many units and what sort of density you're trying to do. Um, and then you can shift over into the, the design phase where you're working with your engineers and your architect um, to, to create you know, the overall site plan and individual floor plans. Um, and then um, once you've got your design wrapped up and your funding in place, then you can go out for bid and work on finding your general contractor. Um, and then once construction starts, that's when uh, the legal documentation part of it starts to really ramp up. And I'll talk more on that in a few slides. Um, um, and then as construction completes, obviously you're then shifting into the selling of the units and um, getting the HOA started up. And then your ongoing work, just like any other CLT unit. Um, so. And then on the co-development, which is where, at least to date, uh, our majority of our direct experience has been. And that's really when you're partnering with another developer who is doing a larger development, but they want X amount of units to be affordable. So um, I know our organization became pretty popular with some of the early developments probably 10, 15 years ago. On um, some of the projects that we have, is it five condos? Four, four condo. Um, my colleague's in here, so I'm, you know, making sure I say the right things because usually he's not sitting in my workshop, um, <clears throat> and he's already told me this is my review period, I'm like six months early. But we won't go into those details. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm surprised it's only three pages, Jeff. Um, but so this is where you're partnering with another developer. And it's oftentimes associated with funding that they may be bringing into a project and there's some affordability requirements. We step in as the land trust. Um, historically, we have raised funds for that particular project, in particular for the affordability gap usually. Sometimes it's a combination of affordability and development gap depending on where the market lands. The developer is actually constructing the project. Our primary role as the land trust is to help co-market, co-fundraise, and then uh, do all the income eligibility, qualify the buyers, do the closing, and then steward the long-term affordability. So it's um, a lower risk option for land trust because you're not taking on the whole risk of the development. And in the case of that situation where there is, the land trust does not own the land. We do a deed restriction, which in our case is called a housing subsidy covenant. And that's a 30 year renewable document that ensures the affordability of those particular units. Do you, do you keep it 30 years because of legal reasons? You can't extend it beyond that? It's my understanding it's because of the legal structure around the deed restriction, yes. But we do the same, yep, mm -hmm. 30 years. Yes. When you say affordability, does that include any HOA fees and anything like that? Since so that doesn't spike on Uh, so that's a very interesting one, and in that is, we have. So there's two things I think we've learned in doing condos and townhomes, and that is uh, the HO fees usually go up, and they're usually pretty low in a new construction, and so in the homeowners have to qualify, that's all in, in from the lender's perspective. But from the affordability perspective, we're really looking at, um, you know, that 
60, 65% AMI, what's affordable, and then what the market price is and trying to figure out that gap. It is taking, trying to take into consider the HOA. What's really difficult is if it's underestimated when that, and the other thing that we found was underestimated a lot, especially new construction was taxes. Oh yeah. So they would come in at $50 a month per you know, for taxes and then the next year it'd be 150. So there's things that when you're working with buyers in condos and townhomes and dealing with HOAs, fees is really understanding, is there some breathing room for that homeowner to be able to weather increases in the, in the HOA fees and in their total monthly cost? And in the situation where we ran into construction defects and the special assessments and having to pay for those, all of a sudden, some of our homeowners' monthly payments almost doubled. And when you think about who is accessing land trust and affordability, that can be incredibly detrimental to households. Um, the other thing that we learned very early on was the importance of educating buyers on HOAs. Because oftentimes people seek a condo or a townhome because they don't want to do the maintenance. I don't want to shovel. I don't want to mow lawn. What they don't know is that there's this whole document of rules and regulations that really do impact how you exist in that community and even within your own units. So, and also understanding the, the power the HOA has. And it was very important that we try to educate our, our homeowners at the time and conversation about having any buyers go through one that's specific to homeowner association and condo ownership or townhome ownership because it is so important that they understand and have a place and have a voice in that HOA and not just kind of like, I'm just going to exist, <laughs> right? Yes, Aaron. So to that point, like when, when the HOA is being set up by the developer, are you guys part of that conversation? Do you have the ability to kind of, I know obviously the legal requirements on it, but yeah, I'm wondering if, and again, I don't know what the percentage of affordability is in, in your kind of, but just wondering if you have a role on that front in shaping, for instance, you know, for your affordable homeowners, they they can only, you know, they can only get a, an assessment X, like they're, they're not going to be charged a full assessment because otherwise they're not going to be able to afford to continue to pay their HOA dues. I'm wondering if you... Historically, no. So in the developments completed to date, we were not, uh, I would say, an integral part of that conversation. One of the things we have in our developer partner policy now is that we do have some say in that as well as a continued, um, I don't want to say a seat at the table with the HOA, but that we are kept informed so that we're seeing financials, we're seeing those type of things. Um, we do have a partnership with Habitat for Humanity where we're doing 17 townhomes and we're much more a part of that joint discussion and we are developing our own first condo development which is seven condos and so obviously learning a lot in that process as well but yeah the second part there actually you said you were in the restrictions for the year mm -hmm. is it re re it's renewable so every resale is yep. Yeah, so it's it's also renewable at the end of the expiration, and with each resale, we terminate the existing covenant and we re-sign a new covenant, and the clock starts over with the new buyer, yep. new homeowner. Yep. Have you or has anyone else had experience with what Aaron just mentioned, where you have different tiers of HOA dues? Like I could envision that being tricky from the dynamics of that HOA if there's an assessment and if certain homeowners are not paying the same as other homeowners that could get potentially political and dicey and so just curious if anybody's done that before and how we, it's gone we have it's a twin home and it's in a larger single family development and the larger single family development has homes that are 800 on up and so they have their hoa because it's kind of built in a wetland area so they have to preserve the wetland there's all these things that they have to do and our the, this project came about through density and so that's the developer had to put in these twin homes for the clt in order to get the development well fast forward and these other homes have turned over and they have new owners in them 
and they're furious that our people, in the covenants, it says these two homes will never pay HOA mm -hmm. um, And it is, and these are people that have plenty of money to pay their own money and take care of our two little people, but it's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, in Boulder, we did a, a development where somewhere here we were the, we were ten percent or whatever of the of the homes were uh, quote unquote in the CLT did a few restrictions, mm -hmm. um, and we up front though had agreed original condo fees for our CLT buyers versus where the market was, and the market definitely was higher. Um, part of the rationale was that you, the CLT buyers, although you couldn't tell the difference kind of like from outside, but the condo units didn't have the same finishes mm -hmm. as the market rate ones. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, high-end finishes for the market rate, which were selling for half a million dollars versus not, you know, decent finishes, but for the condo that was for the CLT buyer at 150,000. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the, the way we were able to kind of make that case uh, so that you know, the market rate folks who are the majority in, in the association weren't flipping out. I, I do think one of the challenges of being a minority entity in those types of structures, we don't own the land, we're not at the table um, on these association conversations. And so um, that scares me. <laughs> <laughs> really, really no, I, I, we've, heard, we've learned some hard lessons. And so I, lot, yeah. yeah. And it's so interesting nice. because the, the project that's been in conversation for about three years with another developer, part of that conversation is the HOAs will be prorated, but it's looking at square footage is the, the biggest thing. So it's oh. not just the, the affordability, but looking at the, the square footage. And so, you know, the larger penthouse is going to obviously pay more. And so it feels a little bit more reasonable and fair maybe from defensible to say, you know, if you have the 1500 square foot that you, the, the studio at 400 square feet should not be paying the same mm -hmm. in HOA fees. Yeah. Um, there was another up here. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess um, if, if it's the sustainability of the CLT is really based on those developer fees and, and they're not the developer, are there any additional fees that are applied or is this something that you, you do if you have to do, but it's not the ideal scenario. The ideal scenario is the CLT fee. It's an interesting question. Um, I don't. This was before my time. I don't think we had developer fees, did we? In the 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 ones that we did were we received a co marketing a co marketing fee. Yeah. yeah. Not at closing, but essentially recognized in our guidance that that buyer process. Mm -hmm. But it was nowhere near what you would see the normal developer fee. We have built in some language in our policy now that's kind of a per unit fee that's a little more hefty, but it's still not a co-developer fee. Um, I think there's some trade-offs because you, you're, you're not having the same level of risk mm -hmm. that you would if you were the developer. So for in a young land trust, and for us, it was a great way to get uh, different housing types without necessarily having to have all this construction financing and now we have condos and townhomes we have single family homes duplexes so it's a very diverse portfolio whereas if we and we didn't start out to be a developer and that's a whole nother conversation so it wasn't really necessarily the path we were taking initially as a young organization so i think there is an opportunity to partner and i think it's it's understanding what you need from a land trust perspective to get out of that partnership and to be confident enough and bold enough to say, this is what we're bringing to the table. <clears throat> and this other funding, especially if it's tied to a funding requirement from a public funder, we're the ones who are going to be stewarding this. We're the ones who are present, even if it's only seven out of the 35 units or 30 out of you know however many, we're the ones who are going to be overseeing and stewarding that for the next however many decades. And so there is a value in that as well because a, a developer could not tap into maybe these sources of funds if there wasn't this affordability and an ability to steward them long-term. So I think it's also having that conversation around that. Yep, Aaron. Is it okay if you ask a question? Of course, yeah. Go for it. So when you have developers coming to you, um, 
both in Rochester and here in Minneapolis. Um, do they say, I mean, are they kind of like, okay, I've got this whatever percent I have to do that's affordable. I'm going to sell them to you, or I'm gonna, here's my price point. The city has told me what my price point is. Is that correct? I've got to have like, and, and the it, it is now, yeah. Okay. And the, and the expectation by the developer is I'm doing you a favor, or is it that they look to you and say, oh, you're really doing me as a market rate developer who knows nothing about affordable for sale housing? Do they look at you as a real asset? I'm curious how that relationship has evolved. The dynamics, yeah. No, I, I, Jeff looks like he's got a point. I, I think early on we didn't know, and, mm -hmm. and we, we had the hunch um, that the land trust units would sell faster and they would meet the pre sale requirements for their, the, the development's uh, uh, financing. Right. That played out, and so I think we saw ourselves with a bit more um, value. Value. Value in, in that whole, thank you, in that, that whole transaction just to say, you know what, we're going to help you meet those pre-sale requirements. It's going to allow you to get started earlier. Right. Um, and, and, and I think our, we didn't know that right out of the gate, though, and I think we were, we were, trying, we were trying to figure it out. But you did something that, that yeah. pre-sale requirement, you, know, you can tell the developer up front, whatever that percentage is, it's 10% or 15%. Hey, I've got this cover. You've got 15% pre-sale. Does that also get you some kind of discount from them or other kinds of concessions or you know other pieces in the deal? Meaning like yeah, I'm just kinda of hyping like max price is two hundred thousand, but instead they're gonna bring it down to one eighty because you're doing you're taking care of that risk up front for them, there's a value for taking that risk and having those big sales. I think it's evolved over time. I think yeah. we, we have a lot more confidence going into these conversations than we did 15 sure. years ago. And, and the way we handled them are way different than we did then. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of what we're talking about was we, we were just hungry to prove sure. we could pull this thing off yeah. 15 years ago. And I don't think that that was a bad thing. But going into it now, we, we recognize the value that we, we do bring into those relationships, especially with the for profit developer. So do you have, I'm just, sorry, do you have like a kind of a menu of this is how we go about it? Well, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so we, um, so a part of what came out of this was, and it, it needs to be reviewed, but we developed, our project development committee developed a develop, development partner policy. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that in this afternoon's presentation. But, um, but it really is kind of a sense of, here's our minimums, here's what we, you can expect from us, and here's what we expect from you. And what has been helpful is that when developers especially in multifamily are coming and saying, we want to partner with you. It's like, well, let me send you this policy so you understand what our expectations are. And then if you're still interested, then we have kind of this process to go through to bring it forward. Um, I think what's interesting about the one that's been trying to get off the ground for the last three or four years is that we were thinking we would approach it in the same way we had historically where we raised funds for the affordability. And the city said, no, developer you need to figure out how these units will be affordable to land trust buyers without the land trust bringing affordability gap assistance so they've been trying to figure out how to do this project and have x amount of units be at an affordable price and still be able to make the the project viable and they're still trying to figure that out but it was a different way of really trying to say this is how we could work with a developer and Stay tuned. We're not sure if this one will actually manifest. Yes, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> if, if I could answer why the city does some, some things that the city does, um, I think I don't know if I'd be standing in front of you. No. Uh, <laughs> my 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 goal retirement job is to make uh, government friendly forms and actually functional forms. So that's <laughs> that's my goal when I retire. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I actually have I have copies Great. as well, but they won't be available until after the uh, three o'clock presentation this afternoon. <laughs> no shortcuts. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go through the classes. No. Uh, if you all at uh, ULC developed a, a co-developer fee or percentage or a yeah, every, every deal is different, and I think you, this is why I'm, I'm asking because I feel like having some more clarity about what the expectations are. I, we use that ground lease to kind of 
frame our development agreement um, as opposed to you know, thinking like you guys are already doing, where you're kind of saying to the developer, here's the minimum expectations that we, we expect to have here, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, we too much rely on our ground lease to kind of frame it all. Thanks, Stacy. This is an area that I have that we're uh, we're in some early conversations with the developer. Like since I came to First Homes three years ago, no developers had come to us, so I'm just used to being the developer. So it's it's been a real shift to the mindset to try to think about okay, if somebody else is going to be the developer, yeah, what do like what do we do? I don't know. It's confusing, but. But it's a great way to leverage, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't take a lot of resources, and you can get a few units out of the deal. Um, and then the, the third model is um, just pretty basic. Um, you know, there's there's this neighborhood, this association of townhomes or condos. It's call it thirty units. Uh, one comes up for sale, and you've got some acquisition money that you want to use. It's a great way to to kind of dip your toes in to see if you want to um, do townhome projects. You can just buy one unit, add it to the CLT, um, and um, they're great because they're typically at a pretty low price. Um, we've had a few in the last year where um, the CLT price is in the low 100s, um, and our acquisition price is in the upper 100s, which you know, you're not touching anywhere close to that on new construction side. Um, you all have done that at First Homes. Yeah. You've bought into an existing CIC. Yep. Um, well, we've, we've done it sort of two ways. We've built into an existing one, and we've also bought a couple of units into a different one, but an existing one. And did that require a refiling of those association documents at the state level and or a vote at the, the, the current association level? No. Is that wrong? <laughs> <laughs> no, congratulations. No. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh-oh. The way I've understood it is that the only way this really works is to identify to, to codify essentially the affordable units within those condo documents. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can do that is by getting the association, if it's an existing association, to vote and then refile those, those documents at the state level. Yeah. I guess the question is, and is, explicitly is put in there it's unit well, one and helps. seven and 12. Only because, I mean, are, at, let's say you're another one of the homeowners you're, you're a homeowner that currently lives in an association, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, this entity is slapping some sort of a restrictive covenant or, or deed restriction on a property. Does that impair my ability as a market rate homeowner to, mm -hmm. to future rights or remedies? And my understanding was that it was always required to essentially get that, that vote and refining of those docs, but I, I yeah, might be learning something. I think there's another layer to that, which is that there is a statutory prohibition against HOAs restricting the sale of units in their HOA of people they want to move next to. So it's kind of, it's create, presenting a complication for you doing a good thing, but it's intended to prevent okay. people being bad. Okay. Um, so to be able to get around that and do a deed restriction on an HOA property without the problem that you're encountering is surprising to me as well. Well, they've cruised through title. And <laughs> <laughs> Just is like, okay, I, never mind. I didn't say anything. Nobody, this doesn't leave the room. This does not leave the room. <laughs> My realtor, our realtor's in the room being very silent. <laughs> No. Um, but but to your point, we way before my time, but first homes back in like 2008 and 2012 developed some condos, and I'll talk more about it in a minute, but in those declarations, it talks about which units are affordable and which ones are not. Which stuff all happens on the front end. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. No, that, do, yeah. So that's where I was just trying to better understand, and, and, and clearly, I think I'm right here wanting to talk to, to our attorneys about what is and what's not feasible, and maybe kind of challenging some of my previous uh, yeah I yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah hopefully hopefully it's all good um, anyway but 
so you've got this added um, due diligence piece if you are going to buy into an existing <laughs> that isn't in addition to what Jeff is pointing out, which is uh, <laughs> potentially valid. Um, <laughs> But the, so the finite, uh, it came up a minute ago about replacement reserves, but really, so as a potential buyer of a townhome or a condo, you have the right to look at the financial statements of, of the association. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so there's that due diligence piece that you need to look and, and see, you know, what are the dues and, you know, yeah, what, ask, you know, Jeff Corey to look over the, the balance sheet. <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> um, to, you know, to know are the replacement reserves going up, going down, and and just looking at their overall condition of the exterior, is, you know, are they, are they, you know, is there a process in place for maintaining this, um, you know, these buildings? Um, so, really, you know, if you are considering putting an offer in to, to put some work into that on the front end before you've closed and make sure you're feeling good about it. Any other? questions on those development models. Yeah. Do you, do you have sort of like a threshold of uh, HOA size or kind of scale that you're looking at from a viability standpoint? I know with Habitat, historically we did a lot of smaller HOAs and those are the ones that really struggle. Mm -hmm. Just from a governance standpoint, um, and so That's... we sort of have a rule of thumb of size now. And mm. that Kind of, you have a minimum, maximum kind of? Like, we don't want to do it if it's less than 15 to 12, 12 to 15 units. Okay. Um, but we there's so much opportunity in that, like, you know, six to eight unit yeah. range with parcels and everything. So it's a tricky blend because it's just really, I mean, those homeowners have to, like, run a business now. So there's this other sort of, like, governance component to this type of this type of ownership and yeah. so we struggled with it and I'm just curious what you've all experienced that's yeah that's an excellent question I mean so in our portfolio we have four you know projects with or properties with four units up to you know over a hundred um, and like the four two of them are CLT units or or deed restricted so and the over a hundred you know were like 10 or 20 percent um, so I don't think we've found that balance, but we've seen some of those potential challenges with the really small HOAs. Somehow they've been working though. Um, so I don't know if somehow we've just gotten lucky or, or but yeah, cause yeah, I mean, if you have only four owners and you need a treasurer and a chair and a couple other people to sit on a board, you've got to all get along and figure out how to, yeah, pay for the lamp. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very possible. Yeah. But yeah, and but we're we're working on a six-unit project right now where the hundred percent of the units will be affordable. So I think that'll go. We'll have to really do some educating mm -hmm. uh, when it's time to sell those units, of, let those buyers know exactly what what they're signing up for. And what do you do in lieu of HOA with the smaller? So we typically try to do twin homes because in Minnesota, mm -hmm. if you set up your flat, those homeowners can just have a party wall agreement, and then there you can avoid setting up an HOA. It's not as dense of a development, but when you're dealing with eight to twelve units, we can do a development that's a little more dense than single family, and we can avoid triggering an HOA. So that's how we thought about it. Um, but sometimes the site doesn't accommodate that, and it still feels like, God, we'd love to get more units than just four single-family homes here, and that's the tension. How yeah. long have the twin homes been there, and how are the maintenance going? Chad, you could probably answer that better than me. Well, there's something that's been around for a long time. And as far as I know, they're doing okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the I can't say that I've heard a lot of problems. And are you involved in the escrow, or who's doing that? Well, so we, yeah, we had a $50 a month payment. 
I'm getting this off track, but we, so we have a handful of twin homes that we did not do right. So we'll just say that. Yeah. Um, there's party wall agreements, and then you put these nice guys, Jim and Jeff, as the bad guys to get the money out of folks when we don't pay. And so Brooke is doing a really good job of cleaning up after us. But I would say, what is it? Maybe a third of the folks have paid what they're supposed to pay. We got better as we went along. Yeah. <laughs> the early ones, not anything, and then the middle ones, half, and the later ones, mostly all. So, yeah. And we didn't have associations, so it's just them, them paying, paying it to us. Um, mm. But I think, like, just, just wanted to, like, in case anybody thinks, well, that's an easy one. There, right. There's more to it yes. that we haven't quite mastered yet. Right. What if you didn't escrow anything? You just put it on them to put it on the owners. Figure out when the, when the west owner wants to yeah. replace the roof, and the east owner says, Well, it's got another 10 years in it. Like, yeah, what are you talking about? Yeah, that's good. No, I get it. Yeah. What's the. <coughs> so then you, on? as CLT, um, initiate the maintenance and decide when the maintenance is needed. We work, to get, we work together. We work together. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we actually have successfully, we replaced a couple of roofs, um, you know, and there was money there to do it. So, I mean, so it's, it's not a complete disaster. Uh, and we we're now painting one hole uh, with the party ball funds. Um, so, uh, but if there was a, they're not fully, um, funded, let's put it that way, if there was a significant, like if the siding just became hugely problematic, we'd have an issue on our hands. But, okay. Um, and so you would have to step in with additional funding? Probably. Or a loan? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Question with the habitat to replace the, the escrow for repair, in that kept property and like a bank account to pull from to the homeowner to repair if they need it? Yes, so uh, the benefit that we have is we're the bank and the lender and so we just have our servicer, American National, collect that with the mortgage payment and hold it. So then when there is, uh, when they have, want to draw on that, they submit a request to us, we review it, we usually they can't do it for hot tubs and whatnot, but review it and approve it and then tell them national to the source. But there's some legal complexity to it because it's their money mm -hmm. and we're collecting it. And so we're actually reevaluating yeah. whether we can continue to do that because it's literally their money yeah. and we're just sort of administering it on behalf of this long-term needs that they're likely to encounter as a homeowner, yeah. but it's, it's their money. So. It raises the question of just how patriarchal do you want your affordable housing program to be around? Okay, we're gonna keep moving forward here. But great discussion. No, thank seriously, great discussion because I the peer learning is Aaron knows I'm a huge fan of peer learning and I think that's some of the most critical stuff that happens at in person conferences. So, oh, hundred yeah. percent. Mm -hmm. Um quickly going to talk about legal docs and it's easy to get into the weeds on this stuff and I'm no lawyer so we'll just stay out of the weeds but just kind of briefly wanted to kind of open your mind to some of the things you'll need to to work on if you do a town townhome or condo project a lot of these things we've already kind of mentioned uh, conceptually so you know the Minnesota state statute for example 515b is the law that that regulates associations or uh, common interest communities um, and uh, some of the key documents that you would need to to draft throughout the the development are like your final plat so it's kind of a site drawing that shows like where the street is where the property lines are where the structures are um, typically a surveyor or your civil engineer would would take care of that um, 
that establishes um, the legal descriptions, legal addresses. Um, your attorney would need to draft bylaws and declaration. That would all be ahead of selling any units. Um, so that just lays out all the rules of how the association will govern itself, forming a board and what the dues will be, and just, you know, they're 30, 40 page documents, so they're, they're pretty in depth. Um, if you're doing a condo, you'd need to do the deed restrictive covenant or affordability covenant mm -hmm. or pick your, pick your name. Um, if you do a twin home project, like a few have been mentioned and we've done a few, wasn't really the emphasis on this presentation, but then you'd need a shared wall agreement, party wall agreement, heard several different names for them, but basically it's a, an agreement that both, so if you have two units, unit A and unit B, and they both are agreeing to, you know, either put money aside in escrow or when the roof needs to be replaced, they're agreeing that they'll work together and it puts some terms in there if they can't work together. Um, and then your key partners for the, for these pieces of the development are your attorney, you know, obviously getting somebody that's familiar with real estate and property, um, your civil engineer, and then potentially a property manager it can be a, a beneficial partner for kind of the ongoing, they, they can take care of, you know, if it's a bigger HOA, they can take care of coordinating the lawn care and the snow removal and some of those pieces and take that off of um, the property owners or the, the board of the HOA. Um, any questions on sort of the legal framework? It's a really, sorry, had to kind of cruise over that quickly. Um, so project considerations, um, these are just, I'm not going to read them all, but these are just kind of some questions that you can ask yourself, ask your organization, your board, sort of the community as you're thinking about doing a project and whether, um, you know, a townhome or a condo project would make sense. I would really um, point out focusing on the questions around, you know, what the goals are, that it's like density, affordability, like really having a, a shared goal around, around that. And then who are you trying to serve? Is it, you know, younger, older, smaller households, larger households, multi-generational households? Because um, I think, yeah, if you talk about some of those questions, you can, find uh, yourself uh, solving a problem by potentially doing a, a townhome or a condo project. And any questions on that or any examples or any details you wanted to dive into on, on those project considerations? It's the one that the, the demographics I think is huge um, and I think really giving consideration, especially organizations as you as you grow the portfolio of homes, in recognizing who will be served uh, by a condo. I think as you pointed out, typically smaller units aren't, but in our experience, they've typically also been wider and, and, and typically don't have children. And so being really cognizant of who you're serving when you when you jump into a condo development. The flip side of that is that we, we've also been able to help a, a number of folks with disabilities and it's been a, a pretty good life cycle tool. Somebody who maybe has lived in single family housing who wants to get into something that's a little bit smaller, a little simpler. So I, I think just recognizing where it sits um, in, in what your intentions are organizationally. But, but you know, not, not to jump into a condo, at least for us, to jump into a condo development and just assume that we're going to serve a bunch of larger families would not be a, a families of color would not be a good assumption. I think right. we're, we're going to try to on this development we're doing, but, but it's a different animal with, with the size of the units there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. I could <clears throat> piggyback on that. When we thought about vertical condos and them, them being smaller, maybe more suitable for seniors than our typical single family houses. We have this dream that we could somehow leverage that into an ability to acquire the seniors single family house, yeah. move them into the affordable uh, condo building, and then have that replacement unit for the larger family. 
they're not kind of first time home buyer, they're not first gen, they're often more white. So it raises all these issues, but they're, I feel like there's something there. Oh yeah. Don't, we've had conversations like that with our board too. Like, you know, if, if, if older people that, you know, you've got a couple or maybe just now one that's living in a four bedroom house mm. and it's paid off. So they have no, you know, motivation to move potentially, but they could, you know, just, we've got, I mean, we could get into, go down that rabbit hole, but yeah, we've got people that are living that kind of mismatched um, with where they're living and based, they, compared to what they really need. Um, but yeah, you could give some weight to, you know, some preference to, to somebody that wanted to sell you their house and, but that'd be a marketing, marketing thing. But, um, in a, in a cruise, we've hit on a lot of these lessons, I think. So, yeah. um, I'll, uh, um, I think a big one, um, that I've, personally run into is on the architect selection side, you know, really, so either working with somebody that you've got a good relationship with or are used to working on that type of housing, um, had a sort of a sour experience where um, it was a project where we built 12 new units in, in an existing um, townhome development. We were kind of it was before I came along, but basically somebody said, well, let's just use the architect that designed the townhomes from 20 years ago when they were initially built. Uh, and it just caused a lot of friction and um, a lot of, yeah, we just really tripped up on, on the design side. Um, and the other big one is, is the zoning. You know, when you're trying to find land to really focus on Ideally, you're finding something that already has the right underlying zoning district or whatever your municipality calls it. Um, we are trying to do a project right now where we're going to request a zone change, um, depending on how easy your planning and zoning and city council is to work with. That can be great, or it can be a pretty ugly process. So, um, did you have any you wanted to add mm -hmm. on to that? No. Say something. And then sort of, so development, so kind of lessons learned throughout the construction phase, really paying attention to the, the common wall construction details. I mean, there's a lot you can do there to prevent sound transmission. So just like being pretty clear with your, your designer, your architect, what your expectations are. Don't just go with, you know, what's maybe easiest or most obvious to really pay attention to that. The sound transmission, um, GC versus CM, so that's more of a, a contract thing. So you've got it, either a con general construction or a construction manager uh, dynamic. And I lean toward the general construction. They, they take more of the risk side. Um, we've got a situation where we're in a lawsuit right now where we hired a contractor and did a construction management mm -hmm. contract. And because of that, it exposed us to this lawsuit about siting. Um, it was one of the condo projects from eight, 10 years ago. So um, other big one, if you're building in an existing neighborhood um, to really be mindful of the neighbors, mm -hmm. keep the streets clean, like just some simple things, be there to communicate really, um, um, empower the the job soup if you have one to to be that point of contact for neighbors if they've got an issue or whatever like neighbors can be really your best friend or your worst enemy they're they're kind of your eyes and ears when when work isn't happening so uh, it can it's a good partnership that could be easy to overlook um, and then post development it, I think we hit a lot on a lot of these I think my big takeaway um, lessons learned from a few of the projects I've seen is um, to give yourself a seat at the table as the CLT mm -hmm. um, to stay. I mean, you're going to be there for the resale. You might as well be there the whole time in between each resale. And um, I don't know, Jim, do you have a comment on that? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is it a good idea? Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I guess, the other big one here is just on the warranty side. Um, 
you know, you can really, you can end up in a, in, in a tough position. So just having clear expectations with your general contractor and being able to communicate to the buyers, um, like who the point of contact is, if there is a warranty issue, how long the warranty lasts, just being super transparent about that mm -hmm. and making the homeowner feel confident that if there's an issue, they know who to reach out to and that it isn't you. And um, we want to leave a little bit of time for just kind of general discussions. There was a couple things that people mentioned they wanted to talk a little bit more about. So I think let's just go around and maybe just one thing that um, felt like it rose up on your table as an important piece. And so I'll just um, start here in the front. And their particular scenario was it was a condo development with a private developer. Um, on a parcel of land from the city to construct a 100-unit condominium, and they want some affordable units, and the developer has approached its favorite community land trust to assist. So what were one or two key things that came out of your conversation? Yeah, a couple were, um, so the developer experience with CLTs or just affordable housing in general, ask that question. Um, from a timeline standpoint, are the, is the developer okay or understanding on um, that you know some of the delays that may come with subsidized you know projects or you know multi-layer projects from a funding standpoint um, the deed restriction structure so um, you know the CLCLT might or the CLT might need need to be the uh, entity that brings that expertise to the project so okay. things like that we had kind of a devil's advocate take on that too which is maybe this project isn't worth our time we don't own anything we're not getting a land lease there's a lot of risk there's a lot of organizational resources involved so we'd go back to that developer and, and demand a equity stake in the overall project in return for our services with the affordable park. Right. bold myth yeah, yeah. Um, and but also a good point is that not every project has to be a yes right part of it is creating that framework for you to evaluate what's going to be valuable for most importantly, your eventual homeowners and what is valuable for the organization. And it is okay to say no. It may not seem like that, especially if you're a young CLT, but you, it's really important to understand how you want to approach the growth of your organization. Um, I'm gonna kind of go back and we'll back and forth. Just a couple things in the back. Um, what was your, just real highlight, what was your? Scenario. We have the same scenario. Okay. Um, I mean, I took a whole bunch of notes as we We had a lot of questions, I guess. So okay. So let's, let's, go, back to, yeah. Yeah, let's go back to that. Yeah. Let's go back to that. Let's see if, um, does it, uh, let's go back here real quick. Anything key that came out of your discussion? Um, so ours is related to the CLT receives a significant donation of land, uh, which it can build a multi-family development and actually we didn't have to pay attention to the fact that it's a multi-family development. <laughs> 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 Immediately failed. <laughs> We had a good discussion. We had a good discussion. And I think, so regardless of if it's multifamily or not, which multifamily obviously goes with a whole different level yeah. of complications that we didn't talk about. But the, the question was understanding why they're giving this land away and are there any are there any barriers or excessive costs? Um, but then also, again, in answering this as if it was single family, uh, the first question was when determining what housing type to construct, what are some key things the CLT should consider? Um, so that I think also when you're looking at land, uh, looking at the location and who are the, who are the types of households we anticipate would be interested in living in this area. And again, really understanding the land itself why was it not interesting to anyone else, or what's, or you know, what is the commitment they've made? Why are they interested in giving us this? And we were a bit cynical about that. <laughs> okay, um, middle, real quick. Um, so we had one that was uh, like a long-term property owner with like a multi-unit rental property um, approached the land trust, um, kind of interested in selling it, like and converting into. Um, ownership opportunities um, so we don't have like a ton of information on it you know so some a big thing was like the deferred maintenance on the building for us and what it would take to get it to a point where you know we'd be comfortable you know selling it off to uh, lower mid-income home buyers um, also like 
wondering like if the current kind of renters in there, how many of them would be interested in pursuing ownership opportunities and trying to you know, keep, you know, not displace everybody that's in that building. Um, you know, key points. We talked about quite a few things. It's kind of for the general neighborhood, but yeah. what do we know about the rest of the community that is okay. Cool. All right, and last one here, and then we'll field a few questions, and then we'll wrap it up for lunch. So ours was nonprofit developer and a CLT team up on a, on a multi-unit project, and the nonprofit developer is going to do the development because they have experience doing that. The CLT is going to end up owning the land, and I think the big takeaway that I got as someone who hasn't done this because it was a little boring for Ben and Jeff because they're doing this deal as we speak. Um, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so who's the declarant, which for those of us that didn't know, me being one of them, uh, is the entity that sort of is on the hook for the warranty responsibilities. And apparently if you're part of marketing the units heavily enough, you can slide into that role even if you didn't build it or have contractually than the developer. So. Uh, that was a pretty good thing to know about. And then you just also the flow of funds being really complicated. Who's doing the fundraising? How does it flow into the deal? When does it flow into the deal? Um, and, and I think the last one, maybe the association documents, the CLT needs to have a say in those uh, on the front end, even though, again, not, not owning anything <coughs> apart from the land. Cool, awesome. Thank you all for participating. And back to this table, you had a couple of key questions. We got a couple minutes, I'm sorry, we're pretty close to time, but I want to be able to field a couple of your questions. I think most of our questions had to do with looking at things like, what is, what are the amenities with this property? Who else is it being marketed to? How is that going to affect what either subsidy needs to go in? Is the CLT paying the subsidy or somebody else? Um, what's that going to do if there's lots of amenities, like fancy pools or things like that? How does that affect the homeowner association fees? What are the CLT loans going to have to pay the same as everybody else? All right, and Reed, you had a comment about the road back. Well, yeah, earlier it was said that uh, just the deed restriction was the only mechanism for affordability in condominiums. And we actually use um, having the ground lease. The ground lease is between us and the COA, the Condominium Owners Association, and each of the owners signs an owner's assumption agreement to abide by the terms of that ground lease. We also have them sign a copy of the ground lease so that we make sure that everyone understands what they got into. And then um, that responsibility pass on to the next owner um, and they'll have to replace that owner's assumption agreement. But that is, so we own the land, we have a land, a, a lease, and it's enforceable, it's just a different structure. Okay. And the ground lease looks slightly different for the townhomes than it does for the condos because of that. No, that's awesome, thank you for bringing that up. Is that in Minnesota? Colorado. Oh, thanks. Do you own all the land? Yes. Under the whole association? We own all the land, okay. and interestingly, our taxes on that land is twenty dollars a year on townhomes. When we own the land underneath that townhome, our taxes are four or five hundred dollars a year. That is interesting. <laughs> Other questions or comments? One or two more, or one more question? And... If not, uh, on behalf of just Justin... real quick, let me hear what other. <laughs> What are, what are fees typically paid for COA or HOA by CLT homeowners? Just throw out some numbers. We pay 175 a year. Yeah, well, 175 a month. 175 seems to be a sweet spot. I see. 250 to 300, yeah, probably. 250 to 300 a year? A month. No, a month. Yeah. That's the HOA fee. Is that really? It does, yeah, and that's why you you got to be very, especially talking to developers, making sure that they're including that in their mortgage calculations when you're challenging them to price at a that 60, 65 percent, mm. that they're not leaving out the HOA, um, because sometimes they'll try to they kind of set that off to the side because they haven't figured it out, and then they have price points that don't really work once you include the HOA. I got one last request. If anybody has tools for projecting out the future cost replacing the roof, mm -hmm. are there calculator tools or how do you go about getting to those numbers? 
If you have any suggestions, can we just email them things to you and we can send them in later? Sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think you know some of those things, great questions on those replacement reserves, and, and in my opinion, they're, they're kind of all over the place, and, and you can hire a consultant to do that, but I think you can also look at some rel relatively recent examples in your community and get some pretty good indicators to it, what those, those replacement reserves should be and how to, how to project for them. Well, if anybody has a spreadsheet that they've created for that very purpose, if you could share that with Jeff, I'd love to see. Great, and I think with that, we will thank you very much for your attention and your participation.